so uh, Senate Government Operations on Thursday, May 21st. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for um, covering me this morning in the Rules Committee, Anthony, and on the floor, if anything had happened, I assume you were ready to take control. Always. I, that's what I thought. So we are going to um, walk through what's left of 124 and see what it is that we want to do with it, what we want to pass and um, what we want to leave in there. And we have the bill back from appropriations that seems the cleanest way to do it so that whatever we do will be a um a strike all and we'll just um send a new version to appropriations because there will still be i assume there will still be an appropriations in there for the pilot plans and if not i mean we'll deal with that when we get to that section so um are there any questions before we get started Okay, so um, Betsy Ann has a summary of it in our document page. So Betsy Ann, would you like to walk us through this and tell me committee here what makes most sense to you. If we look at each section and take each each section and discuss it and get comments on it as we go. So then we can just agree or disagree on that section. And if we disagree, then we can come back to it. But if we agree on it, then there's no point in coming right. back and yep. do right. it that way. Yep. Because we've already spent okay. quite a bit of time on it. Yes. But I want us to just start making some decisions then. Okay. Great. Yep. So Betsy, Betsy, Hello. would you like to walk us through? Sure. For the record, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. Thank you to Gail for posting that. Um, just It's the same section by section summary we reviewed the other day in regard to S-124 as it passed Senate GovOps. So the bill is separated into law enforcement, dispatch, EMS, and public safety planning as topics. And it begins with law enforcement. And the first thing that would happen substantively is amending the membership of the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, this would increase the membership of the council from 12 to 16 members. It would specify who 13 of those members are, and then the governor, Senate, and House would each be able to appoint one public member who doesn't have a law enforcement connection, and those public members could get um, per diem compensation, the $50 standard per diem. And there's a transitional provision to allow people who are currently on the council to continue to serve under their existing term if they would continue under the new membership. Okay. Um, I guess what I'll do is ask if there are any questions from the committee first or comments. Allison? Um, I believe Matt, uh, our chief of the Capitol Police would like to ask uh, if they would be able to have a seat on the training council. Um, I think he did. Uh, I, I think that Matt may, uh, I, I would I, I would suggest that that may be one uh, addition if he, he, anyway, he had spoken to me about it and I was just wondering if he'd spoken to you, Jeanette, and it, maybe it would be a good thing for us to just reach out or see if it was appropriate. Anyway, I, I, don't I, know, I believe that 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 is something he'd love to speak to us about. Okay, um, I I have not, I don't remember that I've heard from him about it. Um, I'm, if, I wanna- I'll, um, I'll text him and, and ask him if he's interested to reach out to you. So um, Betsy Ann, if I wanted to look at the, the best place to see the bill itself, and thank you again to Gail, because she posted what I am just calling an annotated potential strike all amendment that this committee could offer as a substitute to your current strike all. If you refresh your committee webpage, you'll probably be able to pull it up. It's labeled as draft number 5.1 annotated. 
Um, it's annotated because what I've done so far oh. is to um, eliminate or uh, revise some of the language that you have, you discussed at your last meeting um, in regard to changing. But okay. Madam Chair, specifically in regard to your question that the current proposal to amend the council membership starts on page one, line 16. So other than that um, comment, um, does, um, do any of our witnesses, uh, let's see who's here with us, Bill, Mark, is Matt with us? Um, Chris Brickell is here. Do any of you want to comment on the makeup of the training council as it has been changed? And if I don't, I can't, I can only see nine people at a time. So if I don't see you put your hand up, just um, to try and get me audio, audio Lee. Bill, sure. Is, what's the reason behind adding the four, four, four people? Uh, the way it used to work, well, we didn't add four, which four people? Well, you, you're you adding, uh, you said a civilian and who else? The LCT. Currently, yeah. Go ahead, Beth Ann. All right. Yeah, if you wanna take a look at um, the main changes happening. Um, well, first thing you'll see on page one, the commissioner of corrections would be removed from membership and the commissioner of mental health would be added instead. Then on, on page two, the executive director of the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs would be added. And that was an oversight when we did it the last time that they got off, taken off. And right now under current law, the governor, you can see on page two, line seven, that the governor appoints five additional members. And right now it doesn't say exactly who those members would be, only that it would provide a broad representation of all aspects of law enforcement and public. And the governor would be required to solicit recommendations from certain people. And if I'm recalling this committee's discussion correctly, there were some specific groups that really wanted to ensure that they had a seat on the council. And so if I'm recalling your conversation correctly, this would add the people who said, and the, that the committee agreed, should specifically hold a seat on the council. And then the, there was the requirement or the suggestion to add those three public members. So those begin on page three, line three. But the specific people who wanted a seat and who this committee had said before would get a seat is the director, executive director, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. It's a member of the Chiefs of Police Association, a member of the Vermont Sheriff's Association, a law enforcement officer appointed by VSEA, an employee of VLCT, and an employee of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Yeah, I think we, we took a lot of testimony on this three, two years ago and passed it. And unfortunately, it, the whole bill got um, vetoed. And one of, the, one of the reasons, although I think there were more, but one of them was that we had inadvertently, when we put a member of the Sheriff's Association on there, we inadvertently took off the Department of Sheriffs and State's Attorneys. And we didn't mean to do that. We meant yeah. to, to specifically have someone from the Sheriff's Association. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments or concerns? I'm just emailing Matt to get in touch with you if he is interested. So um, he wouldn't fall under any of these. Is he a member of the Chief of Police Association? I don't, he'd have to answer that. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. That's just in regard to municipal police, isn't that right? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, he, anyway, I'm gonna let him speak for himself. I do recall that in the course of informal conversation that this was a subject that came up. So I'm, I'm just reaching out to him. Okay, 
But other than that, are we all okay with this section? Yes. Anthony? Chris? Allison? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right, so Betsy Ann, you may move on. You're muted, Betsy. You're muted. Darn, <laughs> sorry. I'm uh, moving on to uh, still under law enforcement, still in regard to the council. Um, and starting with section four is the requirement to have different training options at the council. So if you're looking at the summary, uh, section four would require the council to adopt rules in regard to alternate routes to certification aside from training provided at the police academy and also would require the council to strive to offer courses in different areas of the state and non overnight courses whenever possible. Section five would require the council to restructure its programs so that by July 1, 2021, a level two certified officer could use- Let's, let's do section okay, four one at a time. first because they are um, kind of separate questions. So we also had a lot of discussion about this and um, given what we're going through right now, it, um, I think that it's something that I'm hearing that the training council is working on anyway, but um, so training council people, would you like to weigh in? So Chris? Yes, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, so for some reason I was raising my hand, but you didn't see me before. On the prior section, if I could very quickly just mention on the membership of the council, um, I'm not clear on whether there is much more discussion about that, but I, I know that there had been some opposition um, on behalf of the council to be adding another member of another labor organization where you had the VSEA added in. And I do remember um, hearing their concerns and the fact that they were representative of another group of, of although it be a, a minority, another group of law enforcement officers that wasn't represented in the other union that was on there. Mm -hmm. um, however, they also would be represented by the Vermont Police Association. So that was the council's perspective on why they didn't believe that another union membership into a training council was really appropriate. Just offering that for, for comment. Okay. I think that we got pretty strong um, uh, testimony from people from the, I think it's about 120 officers that work for the state, but that are not part of the Troopers Association. And they might, I don't know if they're members of the police association or not, but that they had pretty unique um, jobs. And um, anybody, any committee member have a comment on that? Okay, I think that it was pretty clear that we had all agreed and I at the time I don't remember the council having any problems with it, but I um, and, and again, you've, you've already had that discussion many times. So I just wanted to bring it back to your attention because that wasn't um, that wasn't the conversation at, at the council level and we're, we were more concerned with the fact that the the other group that was being represented by the VSEA certainly has as much input to any other law enforcement agency that wants to regarding the the training aspect. We just didn't understand where the, the union issue really was the issue for the training council to be concerned with. Yeah, yeah, I, I do see that. I think that um, you could make the same statement about the Troopers Association. Right. You could. So I think that there was a feeling there that if the Troopers were going to have a special representative on the council, then the other um, union, state union members should also. Right. So. I, that's what okay. I Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, Betsy. So um, the section five then is the um, asking for there to be more flexibility. And this, Chris, for your, um, no, not section five. Uh, where, which one is it? Uh, section four on page four, 
of that draft 5.1 is the uh, alternate routes to certification. All right. I'm trying right. the council at the academy. So, Chris, I know you weren't probably with us a lot when we had this. We did a whole tour of the state and visited eight places and heard from about four to 500 people. And that is four to five, not 4,500 people. And um, one of the things that we heard from almost everybody was that there needed to be more flexibility in the way that the residential program is run and um, offering more things regionally and less overnight. And we heard that again this year with people who want to become law enforcement officers and are probably well qualified and just cannot do it. We heard in particular from the mayor of, was it community? I think it was Winooski, the mayor of Winooski who has a single mom who wants to do it, but she simply can't leave for 16 weeks and leave her child. So, um, and this was something that we talked a long time with the, with Rick about. So um, that that's where it came from. It came from the field. And um, so anybody have any comments about that, about section four? Well, I think uh, the conversations that I've had um, back when Rick was uh, still at the academy was it kind of morphed between section four and section five. Mm -hmm. And I know that the academy did offer uh, much more outsourced training for any agency that actually asked for it. It was just a matter of them letting them know that they needed specific training in a specific topic, and they would send instructors to that agency or to that location regionally where that training could be done. Again, it couldn't be done probably to everyone's satisfaction because of the staffing levels at the academy, and mm -hmm. they just don't have the available people to do it. Where that morphed further was um, in your section five of the really the path to level three certification from level two. And just to, to kind of update you on that, that, we worked on that for quite a bit last mm -hmm. year. Um, there was an active group that was formed for finding a pathway to go from level two to level three training for those people specifically that couldn't commit to that time level, um, that couldn't make it to a full-time academy. And we did come up with a scope of practice that did go along the CLEP model. Um, we came up with a fairly uh, rigorous and authenticated process that people would have to go through to show that if they were going to be doing the same sort of training that level three officers were doing without going through an academy, they had to show proficiency in the standards of what everyone else was doing. We uh, completed that task, and I assume that Rick uh, reported that back to you. What we got, and when we pushed that out to the um, staff at the academy, there were a couple of issues that that working group had put together that they wanted to have feedback on and to have a little more input into um, thinking that there was a couple of things the committee was missing. That feedback um, was given back to Rick, but that committee meeting has not gotten back together since the fact that he's been gone and there's been a vacancy in the executive director's position. So there's been significant work on it. It just needs the process of our academy getting back to normal and having an executive director. So um, committee, what, I mean, we, we can leave this in here if it's all, if it hasn't been totally accomplished, we can leave it in here. And it, when we come back in January or when somebody comes back in January, they'll be able to say mission accomplished. Yes, or and we can get an update on all the fabulous alternative training options. Yeah, I think I yeah we really heard this so loud and clear in the field that I would yep. hope lots would. And is there not an interim director of the council? No, I if I can interrupt for one second here right. on the director's position, and I meant to say this before we started. We, I have heard, and I talked about it with the committee yesterday that um, the, there is a, freeze, a hiring freeze, we know that. Um, right. The hiring in, well, in my opinion, a hiring freeze is that you can't hire new positions. But this is, we feel very strongly that there needs to be uh, some kind of a waiver 
for this position so that at least there can be a permanent interim so that um, uh, yeah. ruling by triumvirate is sometimes very successful and sometimes not. And I think that you all have so much to do in all your other positions that it's unfair to ask you to um, continue to try and oversee the training council. So um, do you want to comment on that, Chris? Uh, I'd absolutely love to. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the council voted to have a panel of three, one of them being myself, the other retired uh, Sheriff Steve Bernard and Major Ingrid Jonas from the Department mm -hmm. of Public Safety to oversee a management team that is now currently in quarantine with the academy class. So they've been working nonstop since uh, two weeks before May 4th when they went into quarantine. Uh, and you are absolutely correct that uh, it's an enormous amount of work and tasks for three people to coordinate and to uh, work hand in hand with the staff that's currently working and doing everything that we're asking of them. I did request um, from the administration the position of an interim um, executive director and was denied. Um, I also requested that we move forward with our, we were in the midst of a um, executive director search and then that we very got, we got very clear direction from the administration that we were to stop that um, executive director search and that was due to, as it was portrayed to me, it was due to the fact that the administration did not have the time giving everything else that they were trying to handle um, to focus on that position. Um, as, as many of you know, I am, not, um, I am not a political person, so I tend to say things as I see them, and I get that, that I don't see them from everyone else's point of view as well at the same time. But the way, the way that I see that process is that is exactly what the council's not only position but responsibility is to do, is to mm -hmm. uh, advertise um, vet those people out and then put that person out to the administration and they always have that ability to say no thank you mm -hmm. um, but we're essentially being told that that's not what we are to do so we're kind of stuck in a holding pattern um, working as best as we can so not that we have any um, clout at all but um, I believe our committee would be willing to um, write um, to the administration, emphasizing the, the real importance of doing this and doing it so that um, when we actually get a little bit more back to normal, we, we can be farther down the road. I, uh, law enforcement is um, in a bad position right now, primarily, I mean, because of COVID, but also because of a lot of other things, but I don't know if that would be. Committee, do you have any feelings on that? Absolutely. I think we ought to do that. I, I, it, okay. Essential personnel, we will be so backlogged if we put this off. It'll be nutty. I, I absolutely think this is an essential position. I agree. Yeah, I, I, agree. Yeah, I, agree. I agree. And I can't imagine that it was done uh, for any sort of budgetary reason. I, I, I don't know exactly. Do you know, who did you talk to, Chris? Uh, well, we, we received that word through the Commissioner of Public Safety okay. yeah. on behalf of the administration. Then we should route our letter back up the chain that way, because yep. I'm, I'm equally puzzled why this would have just not been sort of a standard operating procedure. If somebody leaves, you replace, you, you search, however you decide to do that come up with the best person and then you make the appointment and be done with it. I, I can't imagine it's kind of like having a rowboat with only one oar in my view out there. And it yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. Anthony. I agree. I mean, it's, this is, uh, this is replacing a, a, a position that is necessary. It's not a new, new position. Right. I mean, I always thought of the hiring freeze means, you know, you're not going to hire any more, anybody else, but addition. Yep. an additional person and especially one that's essential right. chris yes yeah um 
Yes, so I'm agreeing, uh, especially, I mean, this is one of the, <laughs> the most troubling things that we end up doing sometimes in government where we ask people to do a task and then we don't give them the resource to do it. So I, I would love to see us try to fill that gap. It's here, here. Everybody. And I, I, would, I would also include in that the ability to appoint an interim so that, um, because we currently right. we're asking three people who also are doing something else to coordinate and right. and run the ship and yep. that just it's hard let, enough let to coordinate get back and actually Allison did you have Allison no, did let you have them get back to yeah. yes I agree okay um so we will um we've we've been writing a lot of letters lately some of them have um had some impact and some of them haven't, but we'll try again. I will send the letter to um, all the committee members. I'll send it to you, Chris. I, I believe Mark, you're on the training council. Okay. And whoever else wants to look at the copy before and make comments on it so that we get it right. Okay. All right. That would be so, appreciated. Sorry, I meant to meant to ask about that at the very beginning, and then I got a little befuddled here because of my sitting in traffic, and so um, I'm glad we got that resolved. So Perfect. now let's go back to section four and five. <laughs> and committee, do you? Uh, and just um, I will try to um, say Senator Bray because there seem to be a lot of Chris's in this world. And every time we have a meeting, we have more than one Chris. And whenever I call on Chris, either both people answer or nobody does. So I will try to make it clear. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so back to four and five committee members, do you have any feelings on leaving it there and coming back with a report? And um, Senator Colomore, I see you unmuted yourself. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as far as Section 4 goes, there isn't really a deadline attached to it. Mm -mm. And I'm wondering whether Chris Raquel, not Bray, um, is, is comfortable with the language that basically it's a nudge from us to say, look, we're really serious about trying to find an alternative way to attract people into this uh, profession. Uh, are you OK with that language, Chris Raquel? I'm absolutely okay with that language. Okay. So I'm fine with that too. And um, the next section does have a date. And I mean, I suppose we can move that. It's a year and two months away uh, that you would by that point have to restructure your programs in terms of moving people on certain levels. And I don't know where that stands given the current situation. I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't in your top two things to be working on the last two months. Well, from, from my perspective, uh, no, it hasn't been, and a lot of things have changed in the last two months. But um, I think that we're one of the things that I know Academy staff has struggled with is, and I know you've heard it many times before, but it's just the, the funding and personnel in order to mm -hmm. achieve what this committee has been asking of. And it's not that they don't want to provide it to you. They, when you just don't have the personnel to provide it, there's a, it becomes a very difficult path to try to follow. Um, we are constantly, especially now, looking outside the box at what does training for law enforcement look like. We've shifted a lot of training in this current academy class to online training. Um, we get a lot of feedback and sometimes not positive feedback from the instructors that this is not the proper way to train law enforcement online for certain topics. and. Some I, I can agree with and some I, I disagree. I think we have to look at everything differently nowadays and we have to, we have to make, we, we already struggle in um, getting law enforcement officers in this state and retaining the ones that we have. So we've got to make every possible measure that we can to make it more accessible to people. Yet at the same time, there are certain things that, that our citizens and our government expect of us to do um, and some of that is physical training and without being able to do that training in a hands-on location and being properly observed and trained to, we're only opening up our state and law enforcement officers to more litigation for improper uses of force and things of that nature. 
So there are there are some some things that would um, are easy to say that we need to do and make it easier and more accessible to people outside of a training academy. Yet at the same time, there is a portion of that that is critical that it is trained to very specifically, perhaps at a certain location, to make sure that we're not creating, you know, bad law enforcement. I see Mark. Mark looks like he Mark. might have input to that as yeah. well. Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, not only do I want to echo everything that Chief Perkel just said, um, I also want to say from my perspective as an instructor uh, for the Academy uh, for Radar and LIDAR uh, and talking with other instructors for various subjects, um, this is uh, the current Academy is going through uh, a very unique set of circumstances. Uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, regionalized teaching. And as an instructor, uh, I provided the class that I teach uh, regionally throughout the state. Uh, Usually our metric has been where there's more students than instructors, especially in a geographically centered area. Um, let's send the instructor to those students rather than the students to the academy or to the instructor. So I've taught up in, uh, I forget the name of the town, but it's some uh, Swanton, I think. Um, I've taught in St. Johnsbury. I've taught uh, down in Bennington as well as in Bradworth. So we've moved our program around and we've done it with great success. Uh, there was something that Secretary French uh, from AOE, uh, I think it was a tweet actually. So sorry for quoting a tweet, but um, it was something to the effect of right now, what we're not doing uh, with our public education with uh, high schools and, and elementary schools, right now we're not doing distant learning. We're doing distant teaching. Uh, and talking with some of the instructors uh, around the state with their different uh, subjects, it's really the feeling has been they're doing distant teaching. How do I provide a, a curriculum that's a lecture with engagement over Zoom when someone's mic cuts out and we have the rubber banding and we have a black screen happen and, and all those things. So um, through my education, uh, I had the experience of uh, learning in both the online environment as well as learning in both uh, in a in-person, in-residence type classroom. Uh, and they are entirely different beasts. And so to the point that Senator Collimore made uh, with regards to section five, and I apologize if I'm jumping ahead of where we're at, um, but I'd really encourage that uh, that deadline be pushed out several years. Uh, there's people who are experts in developing online curriculums and developing the online environment uh, who can really take what is not the skill set of an in-residence, in-person teacher uh, to, to provide that ability and that bridge. Uh, I pick five years arbitrarily, uh, but I think that this needs a lot of time and we need to bring the right people in to develop it because I think it's too important and we're seeing right now, uh, it's too important to provide these, uh, these trainings in other more accessible ways, especially as we start to come into a very uh, digitally native uh, uh, generation. Uh, those will eventually be police officers and we need to take advantage of their learning and the academy has been working to accomplish that but now we're dealing with it uh, while the airplane's flying but it's certainly not built thank you that makes sense to push out the to leave it there and to push it out and it says honor before so it doesn't mean you have to wait so um is so it, would everybody be okay with pushing that out to like it's 20 if we push it out to 23, that's three years. Let's start there and then and then push it out farther if we I, need to. I, I, I given how many resources we have on on uh, learning and, and training remotely, I think f five is long. I do three. I let's start with three. And I think that Mark is right about the I, I mean and Chris was right about that. There are some some things that simply you will not ever be able to teach online, like use of force. I, I, I don't see any way you can actually teach that online. You could have some preliminary. These are the, this is the uh, intellectual reason we do this. This is the, but when you get down to it, you've got to, you've got to do it. So, uh, so to, confirm, Ann? to confirm when we're talking about extending out the date, Section five is the transition to level two to level three. Is that what you're saying should be extended to July 1, 2023? Well, because I think that they're gonna to have to come up with, I, I don't know if that needs to be extended because Chris, it sounded like you were pretty far along with that. But uh, if we- 
We yeah, can extend it to yeah. 2023. Yeah, we are. We were very far along in um, taking the transition from somebody already certified as a level two to level three. But it also sounds like you're speaking about somebody fresh out of the boat to start law enforcement training as well. So, and, and to echo what Mark said, there is a lot of stuff that we can do and push out to online learning, especially for somebody that's brand new into this field. But, but what Section 5 specifically refers to is, is the level two to level three path. So here's a suggestion. Let's leave that at 2021, because that's 13 months, right? Yes. Um, yeah, 14 or 14 months. And if you're well along on the way, and to be honest, we've had these in here, these two things in here for about three years, and we keep then getting reports about where you are. And as um, Brian Collimore said, I don't, re oh, you didn't say uh, fire under the feet. I think you said a gentle nudge. I did. I would never use that other expression. With you. I know. I, I shouldn't. Certainly either. not with law enforcement. Oh, oh, right, right. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, um, so what if we left that date for there and the other one has the other one has no date it's just an ongoing um betsy ann yeah i just wanted to point out actually that section yeah. four that has that's a requirement to adopt rules regarding alternate routes to certification and that actually does have a date oh if you turn to section six there's some transitional provisions that discuss um moving to these requirements and at the top of page seven of the draft number 5.1, those rules right now are required to be adopted by July 1, 2021. Oh yeah. So is that what is that what the sh uh, sheriff you Anderson you were saying we're suggesting should be moved out the alternate routes to certification? Uh, uh, I guess I, I think Chief Burkell said it well that yeah. I'm talking about the the fresh off the street training as opposed to. Yeah. Um, the transitional stuff. I'm not familiar with the work that's been done on the transitional. Uh, I agree, Betsy, and I think I think you're right there. That's the yeah. proper section. Okay, yeah. so, and that's what the committee section. is saying 2023 instead of 2021. Yes, I, I would be fine with that. Got it. And, and then, I, and I understand the nudge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just so much there now. So. Is it would everybody be okay with putting that out an extra two years and that that would because that's that is you're right Mark that is the section that deals with people coming just straight off the street and wanting to be trained and there there needs to be a lot of thought on that. Got it. Okay, so we're okay with up to this point. Okay, section seven. All righty. Um, the, the section seven is mostly cleanup, but it explicitly permits one law enforcement agency to seek certification from the council for any in-service training it provides to its own officers or officers of another agency. The statute just is not clear right now that an agency can get uh, certification for training that it provides to officers outside its own agency. And my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that is that this kind of is the practice it just isn't clear in the statute is that right um chief yes that uh, that is the current practice anybody that receives training outside of the academy submits that training to the academy for approval and they they essentially check the criteria to make sure that it's up to date and current best practice and mm -hmm. then that training is approved if there is any kind of deficiency in it that's clearly worked out with the with the academy and the agency that's that has done that instruction so that there is no disagreement. I think this was put in there just to make it perfectly clear because there were some people who felt a little uncomfortable about that. Am I right about that committee? Yes. Okay. I can't I can't remember that discussion right now. Well, it was it was a brief discussion and because it was mainly a it really wasn't a policy change at all. It was just a kind of a codifying what really happens. 
Okay, so we're up okay up to section eight. All right. So if you're looking at the summary, we're at the top of page two. And this is in regard to a new requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's current agency to obtain an analysis of the officer's performance at that agency. The law currently requires a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's former agency if the officer is no longer employed there. So this would add on to that language to say, in all cases, contact either the former or the current for this new language in regard to contacting the current, it's to get an analysis of the officer's performance. And so how this would work in practice, if you wanna switch over to the actual draft uh, 5.1 amendment, we're on page seven, starting on line 16, the section eight. And it's found in yellow highlighting, you'll see a, a couple fixes I found that might be necessary to clean up the language. One's just to the title, um, because there's, this is now about a duty to contact the current agency. So this language would say that prior to hiring a law enforcement officer, the executive officer of a potential hiring law enforcement agency shall require that officer to execute a written waiver that explicitly authorizes the officer's current law enforcement agency employer to disclose its analysis of the officer's performance at that agency if the officer is still employed there. And then would also have to contact that agency, I'm on page eight, line nine, to obtain that disclosure, which is the reason the analysis of the officer's performance and provide to that agency a copy of that written waiver. So that agency, the current agency knows that it's authorized to disclose it. Um, there'd be a maintenance of the current law that an officer who refuses to execute one of these written waivers shall not be hired by the potential hiring agency. On line 13, if the current agency is a law enforcement agency in this state, the executive officer of that current agency shall disclose to that potential hiring agency in writing its analysis of the officer's performance at that agency. Um, and the executive officer would send, have to send a copy of the disclosure to the officer at the same time the executive officer sends it to the potential hiring agency so that the officer knows what is or her current agency is saying about the officer's performance. Um, and then you can see at the top of page nine, there's just a uh, language saying the current agency is immune from liability for its disclosure unless that disclosure would constitute intentional misrepresentation or gross negligence. So the yellow highlighting just shows some places where it needs some technical corrections, but it's very similar to what is already required in the law, except that um, in this case, an officer would have to let his or her current agency know that the officer is seeking other employment versus the current law where, uh, where the officer is no longer employed at the agency. So this uh, came from the council, the training council. Um, and uh, so one of the things that um, Mark brought up last time was, uh, first of all, you have to let people know that you're leaving someplace and going someplace else. But does this impact um, transfers between Vermont and New Hampshire at all and how would it how would it impact that so I I am not sure and uh, it sounds like a good idea we've done the same thing for teachers but I since this came from the training council I guess we should let the you uh, comment on it and say if it is the right way to go and um, why or why not so chief would you like to um, I can't speak specifically to the the issue with an out-of-state agency. I do know um, in discussion with the executive director that the main concern here was the fact that it was um, only limiting the council to look at issues where agencies were contacting um, a former agency rather than a current one. And it was a big uh, gaping hole in what they saw as the potential for someone that had um, misconduct issues to go from another agency 
that we covered a former officer. We covered one that had left prior to um, uh, an internal uh, being done, but we didn't cover the issue of a current. So that's that was the main push behind that. And so you're still comfortable with that language? I, I am, as as it's been highlighted here. The the only thing that I was not privy to any discussion on would have been with an, an out of state agency. Yeah, and that I don't think it's specifically addressed in here at all. But Mark did bring it up to us the other day, and since um, we're in our county, we're relatively close to a couple other states, and um, they seem to want our officers. Right. It's the poaching, the out-of-state poaching, and the interagency poaching. Well, I think this has less to do with poaching right. no, no, I, than I with um, making sure that um, people who are currently in a position and are having a some kind of an investigation or um, being let go for a certain reason, but they're still employed there, that the hiring agency has the ability to talk to the current agency. Right. Yeah. I so you're this, this is important, I think. You're still okay with that language as it is and we'll have to deal with the out-of-state question. I, I, I don't know how we address that because we can't control. Mark? Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I I guess I my question from the last meeting was more clarification. Uh, mm -hmm. If I get a call from, I'm going to pick a, a town just across the river, uh, Hinsdale Police Department in New Hampshire. If they call me saying they'd like to conduct a background investigation regarding one of our officers, uh, do I need to to respond under this section or do I need to respond differently? And it's I'm not opposed to the language as is. In fact, I'd be perfectly comfortable sharing the information. I would desire to have a conversation with their chief prior to them taking in one of my deputies. Um, so I'm okay with that actually being, I'm just not sure if it does say that. Betsy Ann, what do you think? So let me just confirm, you're talking about an age, let's call it a New Hampshire agency, wants to hire your Vermont officer. So subsection A would not apply because this is dealing with an executive officer of a potential law enforcement hiring agency. Law enforcement agency is actually a defined term in the Criminal Justice Training Council. And it means an employer of a law enforcement officer. Law enforcement officer in turn is defined as only Vermont officers. So subsection A is not applicable. Let me see. I think it would, let me just look at subsection B again. That current or, See, subsection B, I read it as relating to subsection A because it flows from it, because it's saying if that current or former agency is a law enforcement agency in this state, mm -hmm. the executive officer has to disclose its analysis of the officer's performance. So I've, I feel like this is really focused on addressing the potential hiring agency's request if the potential hiring agency is in this state. So I'm not seeing this, I'm not really reading this as applying to responding to, for example, a New Hampshire agency. I think it would, if, if this doesn't apply then, it would just be a matter of whether there's any other provision of employment law that would prohibit it. Um, I don't think that there is because this language um, is permissible. So it seems like it would, if uh, you could respond to a New Hampshire agency, so long as there's not like a non-disclosure agreement that you have already you already have with that officer to not disclose um, any information about the officer's performance. That's how I. But you wouldn't it. be in trouble under this law if you didn't, because but you would if 
it was a request from Wilmington. Yes. Does that answer it enough? Gray enough? Madam Chair. Okay. So we're still okay with this language then? Okay. Section just nine. Note, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, I'll just note that. Uh, exactly, Madam Chair. That section nine is related to section eight. Mm -hmm. It's um, essentially a grandfathering clause to say that the requirement of a current law enforcement agency to disclose its analysis of an officer's performance at that agency does not apply if there's a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective date of that section. So if there's already in effect some sort of non-disclosure agreement that would prohibit the agency from disclosing the officer's performance, then this requirement wouldn't apply because that contractual right. obligation controls. Yep. Okay. Okay. Then we move into unprofessional conduct. Um, still in regard to the council's authority, we're on page two of the summary in section 10. Um, the first uh, item in section 10 is clarifying that the list that currently describes what constitutes category B unprofessional conduct um, is that the current um, Examples of category B conduct are those that category B conduct shall include the list provided in A through E um, to make it clear that those are definitely category B unprofessional conduct, but it's not an exhaustive list. Um, it's just that the current law says such as, which is not as strong of language. Then the next thing that this gets into is that change of category B um, including excessive use of force, first offense rather than second offense. And that has the rippling effects throughout several issues in the unprofessional conduct subchapter. It deals with when conduct gets re alleged category B conduct about excessive use of force gets reported to the council, when uh, the council can take action against an officer certification for um, category B conduct um, because essentially right now, the way that the language is structured, um, council can't take action on a first offense of category B and a first offense is defined as including excessive use of force. Second offense, that means the council, first of all, might not find out about excessive use of force first offense. And even if it did, it's not really able to take any action until the third known offense of excessive use of force. Big improvement. And this this actually also came from the, the council. Um, are we okay with that? Absolutely. Senator I mean, I'm, well, I'm okay with it, but I just want to understand. So if somebody engages in misconduct, including excessive use of force, I may know, I may hear about it because we're all in the same place in a sense, but I can't do, I'm a superior, I can't do anything about it, even even if I become aware of it. That just seems, I don't know, seems odd to me, interesting. I mean, I understand why it's there, but it just seems interesting. Well, the law enforcement agency itself, the, the employer of a law enforcement officer can of course take whatever disciplinary action against the officer at that agency itself. It's just that the council regulates officers overall like OPR regulates its professionals. So this is in regard to the um, action that the council can take against an officer. Oh, I get, I get, I wasn't, yeah. so the employer could take action. Yeah. Okay, I, I didn't quite get that. Thanks. And the, the, um council doesn't wouldn't take action necessarily on the first one but it they they can take action on the second one but if their first one is never reported then there's not a second one until a third one actually who's on first exactly That's the <laughs> i don't know i really miss betsy ann explaining this the triple whammy it's true okay all right. Are we so, all okay with that oh, then? Sorry. Yes. Uh, Chief, are you okay with that still? I'm with. I'm good with that as well. <laughs> okay. 
great. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to, yeah. Um, are we done with law enforcement? Uh, almost. Um, at the top of page three, just another issue in regard to the council is uh, when the when an law enforcement agency has to report um, category B conduct, alleged category B conduct to the council. And if you look at the actual language of the bill at the bottom of page 11, current law says that the agency um, is to report to the council alleged category B conduct when the agency re receives a complaint against the officer that, quote, if deemed credible by the executive officer of the agency as a result of a valid investigation, alleges that the officer committed category B conduct. So right now the current law is contingent upon the agency itself deeming a category B complaint credible and conduct after it conducts a valid investigation. So it's really relying on the agency to conduct its own valid investigation and deem a complaint credible before it even gets reported to the council. So what this language would do is delete that language if deemed credible by the executive officer as a result of a valid investigation so that an agency would have to report categ alleged category B conduct to the council when the agency receives a complaint against the officer that alleges that the officer committed category B. The agency itself, in most cases, would still conduct that investigation and would report its results to the council, but by eliminating this language, the council would be, ma be made aware of allegations of category B conduct, and it's just a better way for the council to track these allegations and to track you know, the status of the agency's valid investigation of that allegation. So let's um, look at this from the other side of it then, instead of asking if the council still agrees with this, since this came from the council, we have three executive officers here of law enforcement agencies, um, Sheriff Anderson, Sheriff Boniak, and the chief. So as, as executive officers, let's, um, Ask you if you agree with this. Yes, Sheriff Pontiac. Absolutely, we want to, you know, maintain that transparency and uh, with with the way social media is set up today and our current news, you know, the media. Whenever there's an incident like this. We want to make sure we're being, you know, 100% transparent. So um, we want to make sure that all the law enforcement executives are following these rules and uh, keeping <coughs> aware of what's going on. Thank you, Sheriff Anderson. You're muted. I am muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I do agree. Uh, Again, it makes sense in terms of the, uh, the component of transparency. Uh, the only concern I have with it is what uh, implication it would have on the academy or the council's staffing uh, and what volume uh, would be handled by this. I'm not sure that there's an answer to that question. It's just a comment. Uh, but my concern would be that this could be an enormous burden on the academy in considering uh, offering an investigator to the academy or the training council to perform these types of uh, duties might be necessary in the future. I, I, I may have misunderstood either your question or the, I thought that it just um, will receive the complaint, not that it will investigate. That it will just receive the report of the complaint. I guess my question was if we receive, if the training council receives a report of a complaint but does nothing with it, does it achieve accountability or transparency? If we have a stack of 100 bankers boxes of complaints that we do nothing with, the council could be placed in a position where it's saying it's dusting things under the carpet. Um, and while I, I don't mean to insinuate that the council would try to sweep things under the carpet, I also have concerns that uh, that could become a future concern. And if I could, Madam Chair, I can also okay. speak to a portion of that. Again, um, getting back to the original uh, intent that was proposed by the council was that exactly as, as Betsy Ann had described, was that you were really looking at a third offense before anything came to the council. So this really does put the onus. And 
it's actually easier for agency heads to move to this method because if they know that they have to make a complaint or they have to make a notification to the council upon the complaint of Category B conduct, that's much easier for them to do and easier for the, the council to track and then follow through with that progress. A lot of times the agencies, this is all completely new to them that they're still trying to you know, understand, and then they get started into an internal investigation and they get wound up in that, and by the time they get that done and then they take their action, there have been some agencies that have forgotten to then forward that information onto the council. So it's a council catch-up phrase that they have to go forward with. So this makes much more sense to have it reversed as soon as the complaint is received that they notify the council. But to Sheriff Anderson's point as well, the council can cause an investigation to be done if there is deemed an investigation that wasn't a valid investigation. And that is another resource on the council that the council does not have available to them at, at this point. The, we definitely have the availability of, of tracking it and taking action, but when it comes time to, and there will be times that the council will be tasked with doing its own investigation or contracting out, these are, in these budget times that we're facing now, these are things that are going to be critical to the academy and to the training council doing the proper way and making sure that we're, we're doing those investigations if they have to happen. So, yes, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd appreciate it whether Chris or, or Bill or Mark would allay my concern. I'm thinking of a situation where a fellow law enforcement officer becomes irritated and upset with a fellow officer and just starts making complaints uh, left and right, which are probably unfounded. Is there a me mechanism here that, I mean, you can't prevent that, I guess, from happening, but does this happen a lot? Is it is it a concern I should have or, or does it rise to that level? I can only speak in uh, hypotheticals to that. I can tell you that, yes, that does that potential exists, um, and that there could be the possibility of that and that exhausting a lot of law enforcement time, um, needless law enforcement time. And, and I guess that there really is no way to um, vet that out yet until we start to see these complaints in the agencies, how, how they begin to handle them. Um, but that is, that is definitely a concern. I assume that's why earlier, the existing law needed the deemed credible by the reporting agency before it got to the next level, but maybe not. In all honesty, I think that that, uh, that was in there due to the fact that sometimes um, there are erroneous complaints made against law enforcement officers just for retaliation or someone's not happy with the way that something worked out for them. I don't believe that it was looked at from another law enforcement officer or agency to complain about another officer or agency. But that, again, that potential does exist, and I'm not quite sure how, how you could restructure that to eliminate that. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So, uh, um, yes, Sheriff. I agree with, with Chris. It's uh, especially if internally, if you say you had a promotion and the person was overlooked and then also that person just starts uh you know making erroneous complaints about the person who is getting promoted and uh so you know we have to make sure we're, you know internally we're ruling those you know making sure they're not valid and you know so but everything's being looked into that's i think that's what has come out in the last couple of years more and more, and I think just about every complaint that comes in statewide is being investigated in one, one form or another. And that's, I think that's the biggest thing that came out of, um, out of that Act 56, so. And remember, this isn't all complaints. This is category B complaints. Right. Right, so this, this doesn't refer to the, hopefully the, the minor, the, kind of right. retaliation kinds of complaints. Uh, Mark? And just to, to build off of what uh, Sheriff Boniak just said, 
Uh, if I received a complaint towards one of my deputies and I thought it was erroneous and uh, baseless or even uh, fraudulent, that I have the counsel who's still able to receive notification and agree with that um, provides me some uh, some reassurance. Uh, I'm human. I'm infallible uh, or not infallible. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think it's important to note that. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. So before we jump on to whatever Betsy has in store for us next, let me just say, um, Chief, when you were talking, you you mentioned budget. And I we had not discussed this before, but we've been talking with um, those areas under our jurisdiction to about whether there are COVID-related um, budgetary issues that need to be um, addressed or should be addressed in the CARES Act money, CARES Act, CARES money, I guess, whatever it is. Um, and what those, what those might be, we've had um, information from EMS, um, we're getting information from the sheriffs. So I would say that if the academy itself has um, budgetary needs that were impacted by COVID, you should get those to us um, as soon as you can. And then if you if there are others that couldn't be co uh, specifically COVID related, but are um, budgetary needs that have been shown to exist, get those to us too. And then we will try to get that to the um, appropriations committee that's what we're doing and um, try and let them sort it out. So um, if, you, if you can get that to us, that would be great. And we'll try to get it to the appropriations committee. That, that would be much appreciated. And just so that you're aware, there are a lot of um, COVID expenses that have impacted this, this academy class. And um, the Department of Public Safety has been instrumental in helping us with that and applying for the grant funding to cover these uh, costs that we're going to be incurring for this. But, but I agree, not, not just only COVID related issues, but some of the, um, some of the legislative issues that the council is being tasked with come with associated costs. And unfortunately they can't continue to be done at the level that they're, they're being done at and, or, or not done well, I can say that. Um, and so it's really critical that if, we want to be able to do exactly, you know, what the committee is, is looking for and, and doing it in the right way. But at the same time, with all, all other issues being equal, we still need to have that even just level funded budgeting to continue with what we're being tasked to do. But I will and, certainly and I get would, those numbers to you. Yeah, that would, that would be great if you could do that. And, you know, we, we often mandate different types of training. That's a, there's a cost to that. That, and we've done a lot of that over the last couple of years. So we need to know what those are. So that would be great. And I do believe the commissioner is joining us tomorrow to talk about some of the, um, what he sees as um, budgetary issues in the department. And maybe he'll um, talk about the academy also. Thank you. All right. So, and if you can do that, unfortunately, the um, Appropriations Committee is starting to deal with the Budget Adjustment Act next week. So we would love to have anything you have and we could, um, you probably, I don't wanna put more work on you, but the sooner you can get it to us, the better. Actually, I'd like to just thank Sheriff Anderson. He um, sent the Excel spreadsheet out to all the sheriffs and actually, my staff at the beginning of our meeting, she walked in and she handed me uh, my my department's uh, graph and all the all the pertinent information. So yep. um, it is it is interesting, and uh, so hopefully um, we could get some assistance. Um, that would be uh, quite helpful. Well, I was going to write up a. Um for, I was hoping to get it done for today, but I didn't. 
um, some of the losses, and this is specific to the sheriff's departments, but um, I've got a bunch of information here. So um, I'll write that up and send it out to you and you can see if it makes any sense. Very good, I really, really do appreciate it. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I have to go to another, uh, we got to do a, get something going on on the other side of the county. So um, I have to drop off. Are you actually physically going to the other side of the county? I will be, yes. Oh, lucky you. So, yeah, hopefully it's something good, Bill. Yeah. Well, it is. It's uh, it's a graduate. It's one of the graduations we're helping out oh. with. Oh. So we did it. We did Randolph Brookfield Braintree. Uh, yeah, Chelsea, and then um, on the other side of the county. So uh, it's been interesting. You know, one other thing that has come up uh, actually uh, overnight. Um, we made an arrest last night of a, um, a female intoxicated out of control and uh, she spit on three of my officers. Oh, ooh. So I reached out, you know, the, to our state's attorney and uh, also right now I got the attorney general's office involved with this because we're, we're hitting this new gray area of could we mandatory we force her to do COVID testing? It's a, yeah. it's a huge question right now. So, you know, right now we have to wait. And I'm one of the people I got home four o'clock this morning. Um, we're, we have to wait seven days and they're going to test five of us. We had three that we're dealing with the actual incident. And then two of us, we end up transporting her. But uh, and one of the things that if you look in this green uniform I'm wearing, I call this our COVID uniform. I purposely purchased a couple extra uniforms for each deputy. So if we run into an incident like this, we get changed before we go home. So we don't possibly contaminate our families. So um, it's been interesting. Well, we did talk about whether um, the sh law enforcement uh, should get hazard the essential person's hazard pay and uh, the way they do it at the state level seems a little um, bizarre, but I don't know how else you'd do it, but. Yeah, this, it started out with this, this lady last night, 48 years old, she decided to stab her ex-boyfriend. So he had multiple stab wounds on his body and he, 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 had, he got uh, medical assistance, but um, you know, he'll be fine, but. It was just a, a wild night. She tore one of our offices too. So, well, I hope you're all okay. Everybody's fine. It's just the unknown now, you know. For I the know. Next yeah. Time. Yeah. So you just want to get tested. Yeah. Next seven days, we have to wait seven days. We have to wait, you know. But okay. I, I want to have her tested because she's she's the one that you know spit yeah. on the office. So, why do you, Why do you have to wait seven days? What's that about? about? Incubation period. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but she should be tested immediately. You're absolutely right. Right. So you know, that's why I called the attorney general's office. And I guess we're going to be, we might be a test case. So oh. I don't know if we were else in the state. Right now. So well, you would hope that uh, after the intoxication wore off, she'd just do the right thing and get tested and not force you to be in that position. Right. But, well, we're sorry for your troubles. Yeah. I don't know. It's part of the job. It's that's what we do. <laughs> yes, but being spat on it takes on a totally different meaning now. Oh yes. But it, it did with AIDS too. Right. So it was. Yeah. Well, enjoy the graduation. Well, thank Bill. you. Thank well, you. Good. Go have good have graduation. A good thank you. Thank you. So, Betsy Ann, are we done with law enforcement now? We just have a few more sections. I'll go really fast. Okay. Uh, section 11 is in regard to the treasurer proposing a retirement plan for municipal officers that's similar to the state officer plan. Yeah. Did you want to leave and that I, in there? I, I think that we, we're going to have to have some conversations with the, the treasurer about this. I'm not sure that she's ready to, we'll, we'll have some conversations with her because it is something that's important to, 
us and to, important to law enforcement. But um, and I I do know that she it, at the very least would want the date changed. Okay. Uh, section twelve is that required? Mark uh, just real quick on this, um, the sheriffs across the state fall into a weird category here. There's Group C retirement, then there's the Group F retirement, and then there's also the VMers retirement. Some sheriffs mm -hmm. are in the Group C, some sheriffs are in the Group F, and some are in the VMers retirement. So I would like to ask that something be considered in terms of how we're considered, because this has been an issue we've been trying to uh, straighten out and uh, Madam Chair, I know I've spoken directly with you about. Yeah. And I know that the treasurer has has promised to do something. I just, I don't know where she is right now. So I think what I'd like to do is kind of leave this here for more discussion and have her come and meet with us. Uh, here, here. And um, Sheriff Anderson will make sure that you get a notice of when she comes. All right, section 12 is that requirement for the Vermont Crime Information Center to establish the definitions that all officers would need to use when they're entering data into their criminal record system, whether that is Spillman or Valcor, the point is for all officers to use the same definitions. Anybody have, and I think they, um, Jeff Wallen, he isn't with us, is he? He has said that they're working on them. Okay. No, I, I think this is still important, so keep it. Yeah, definitely. It seems we shouldn't have to pass a law to do it, but certainly should keep it. Well, I don't know that we have to. It as I I think of this as uh, the same as Senator Collimore's nudge. This right. is something that should be done, and let's just keep the the momentum going. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay. So Section 13, oh, sorry, is that requirement for the VCIC to provide on a quarterly basis to the legislative, legislative body of each town without a municipal police department a report describing the crimes alleged to have been committed in the preceding quarter? I guess on, uh, we should hear um, from VLCT and VCIC about um, whether that's not really a law enforcement issue. It's mainly a, a reporting issue and how they do that and whether it still makes sense to have there. We know why it's there. Does that make sense, committee? Yes, sure. Okay. All right, sections 14 through 17 are in regard to the law enforcement advisory board, just mm -hmm. moving where it um, resides in statute and then amending its membership to add, um, when you were still at the State House, you had added um, the Director of the Enforcement Division of the Department of Fish and Wildlife to the LEAB. And then Madam Chair, you had requested last meeting to uh, also uh, add for the committee's consideration, add the Director of the Enforcement and Safety Division of the DMV to the LEAB. So if you look at your revised draft 5.1 um, that the Director of enforcement at DMV would be added on page 16, line 16. And we had that request, I had that request from the, from DMV. And, and Madam Chair, yes. uh, I having emailed uh, our chief of the Capitol Police, he has responded to us. Uh, and uh, I think this is the area that uh, I had mistaken. It LEAB is, I think, was Matt's first choice, but he feels, anyway, he sent you an email. So um, yes, he'd like inclusion where where others are. But on the LEAB? First and foremost on LEAB, second, uh, read, read the email, yes. Okay, I, okay. All right. Does that, did everybody get the email? He sent it just to you and me because I emailed him. Okay. Uh, he, so says, get he says, I think it was the LEAB. Um, that said, if you ever see DMV enforcement game wardens, 
liquor and lottery somewhere and we aren't, it would bear consideration to add us. The four small state law enforcement agencies with unique missions often get left out. So we do not have those on the on the training council. We do have a, a member from uh, the BSEA, right? A law enforcement person from BSEA, but we don't have specifically DMV or game wardens. I, th or, I thought on the council, I think the commissioner of fish and wildlife is there. I can quickly go to the front page. Yeah, commissioner on the criminal justice training council, the commissioner of DMV and the commissioner of fish and wildlife are members of the criminal justice training council. Yeah, I, I, anyway, I know Matt would like to chat about it. Okay, all right, we'll have him come the next time we do this. Okay. And the last thing in regard to the LEAB on page 19 of the amendment is to say that in their 2021 report to the General Assembly that the LEAB would need to specifically recommend ways that towns can increase access to law enforcement services. Are we all okay with that still? Yeah. Yes. And I sure. think Wynn is on the call with us. Are you there, Gwen? Do you still think we should have this here? We do. I guess. Hi there. Okay. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I was muted. Hi. I apologize. What was the question? So we're asking um, the LEAB to come up with suggestions once again on um, how towns can. Um, without telling them that they all have to have contracts, which is what we would like to do. Um, we're telling them to come up with um, ways to improve um, access to law enforcement for towns. It's just a report. Um, right, so I think there's like three different sections in the bill that sort of speak to this, including yeah. um, the reporting from um, VCIC and then in the latter portion of the bill with the um, town, you know, sort of plan, not plan, but sort of the um, an emergency plan. Right. Um, so I think they all speak to each other. So I don't, um, I think that, I, I don't think we have a problem with this. I think that um, there's already an ongoing discussion. So it's um, sort of a, it's moving a little bit of a snail pace given the current times, but um, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, an, it's been an ongoing discussion. So I, I don't, I think, I think the timeline, um, I'm not, I, I won't jump to the later section, but I think the timeline set out for the t sort of town emergency plan stuff um, is um, workable as well, so. Okay, great. Well, we're used to snails. So Good. Um, we just, as long as they have the little shells on them, so we they, love it because those grubs never move. <laughs> we want them to be, actually be snails know, rather love, than grubs. I love escargot. <laughs> okay, committee. Any um, any uh, comments on that section? Nope. Nope. Well, as long as you're fine with it, I am too. Okay. So I think that other than, other than having the discussion with the chief, we are all okay with the law enforcement sections. Am I right about that? And, yes. And the treasurer's um, report, those two. Yep. yep. Yes. Okay. All right. I. Yes, Chris? Did you, Chris Bray, did you start to say something? <laughs> All I said was yes. Okay, hold on one. Chris, um, Chris Bray, I like your new background. It's a little more springy. <laughs> It is. Tell us what we're looking at. Well, so I'm a little sad because that's we, where we don't live. But that was the view um, at the farm of the turnouts in the hayfield behind. Oh, lovely. 
It's beautiful with the gray clouds and the sort of yellow, yellowy. It's it's great. It's sort of a wolf con kind of color contrast. <laughs> okay, so I think that with those two exceptions and um, some potential um, budgetary information from the academy that, and then the we'll get the I'll get the sheriff's budgetary stuff out to the committee. So those four things are kind of what's left with law enforcement, but the, and the two budgetary ones aren't really part of this there to go to the appropriations committee. Am I right here? Okay. All right. So I am going to, um, while the, well, Sheriff Anderson is still with us. I am going to tell you that I wrote to Ted Brady and um, Secretary Curley yesterday about the fingerprinting issue. And here's what I got back. Thanks for the note. If an operation can occur without physical contact, such an activity to current concur currently occur under low or no contact professional services, um, services operating with a single worker or small office environment, um, such as may operate if they can comply with the mandatory health and safety requirements listed above with no more than 10 persons present at a time. Remote work is required whenever possible. Operators must maintain a log of customers and their contact information for 30 days. And if, as I suspect, physical contact is required, we hope to have an announcement about these contact personal services in the coming days that may report, it may impact them. If that doesn't work, can we um, revisit it then? So it sounds like they're looking at it. And I would suggest, I suggested to him that the only physical contact that really is necessary is this, right? When you, yes. and you could wear gloves and you could do a plexiglass um, thing like you do at the grocery store. Um, so uh, anyway. Madam Chair, uh, yes, uh, it does require physical contact. We do have uh, PPE uh, to help shield uh, our person operating a fingerprint station. Uh, this is a, a station used by law enforcement as well as for uh, civilian contact. It is in close proximity. So uh, while we hope that uh, the restrictions in terms of the, the close physical contact um, could be permitted in, in some way, shape or form, I think there's really more of a, a desire uh, to ask the various agencies and departments in the state government uh, to extend their, their requirements for fingerprinting. Uh, it's not that we're saying we need to be able to fingerprint. We're happy to fingerprint, especially essential personnel. Our concern is, is that we have teachers, nurses, doctors who are reaching out to us saying our license is about to expire. When can I get fingerprinted? Uh, we just turned down the security for the uh, judiciary saying we are being advised that this is not a necessary thing to be done. Uh, and so we have notified judiciary of that as well. But the concern is, is that there comes a day where these licenses do expire. There will be a lot of angry Vermonters who are pointing at me saying, why am I not getting fingerprinted? And I'm just because you're your agency isn't doing something about it. Um, so we're, we want to be a team player in this. We want to try and help where we can. It makes sense for us not to do fingerprinting right now. Uh, we agree with that. We're just uh, encouraging uh, agencies and departments to look at the requirements, ETF, uh, uh, AHS, AOE, uh, and say, you know what, let's grant a 90-day extension, similar to DMV extended driver's licenses, registrations, and things like that. Okay. We, uh, we had this conversation yesterday and it seems simpler to just allow than to get every one of the licensing agencies to agree to it. But um, I, I think that we'll, uh, uh, we'll continue to pursue it with ACCD. Thank Allison? Uh, Mark, in our uh, neck of the woods, it, it, fingerprinting becomes very important for summer, for summer programs with kids. And those are going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, DCF was ridiculously requiring teachers to get fingerprinted again. I mean, when they're already fingerprinted. So uh, the reason that actually, I think it, you may hear more about it is summer programs because they, with kids, they're required to have fingerprinting. So um, it actually may be time sensitive. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Clarkson. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, and I think that the purpose for fingerprinting is really to preserve the safety of our children. And as we permit these things, uh, we should encourage it with proper PPE, just like we're requiring law enforcement to wear PPE in close contact. This is a similar safety standard. And so uh, in my conversation with uh, Madam Chair, uh, it made sense to say everybody wears a mask, we wear gloves, we do proper cleaning and, and sanitizing, and let's push through with this. It's a safety issue yeah. through and through. Yeah. Well, we'll keep we'll keep up the conversation with ACCD. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we ready to move on? So, M Madam Chair, may I just ask before we launch into dispatch? Yes. Um, are we? Uh, 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 for those of us, are we going to aim to be done about five of four so that we can join the transition uh, Senate call, uh, Senate meeting? I think we should. This actually yeah. has ta taken a little longer than I thought it would, but I think that we should, and we can take this up again. And th this is a not, um, and I apologize to people who are sitting around waiting for us, um, but this is, this is not a time sensitive issue. And I want to make sure we get it, we get it right. Yep, I agree. Okay. So yeah, we will, we will conclude about that other meeting is at four. Yeah. Okay, we'll conclude about ten minutes of so that um, people can right. have a chance to move and get a cup of water and whatever else they need to do. Great, thank you. Yes. Okay, Betsy Ann. All right. So we're on page four of the summary in getting into DPS and dispatch. There's some cleanup language going on in there, but in regard to dispatch, that language is in, let's see, is it section, section 18? 18. Thank you. So if you're looking at the actual draft language, it's on page 20, and it's a requirement for the commissioner of DPS to adopt rules in regard to two dispatch issues. First, the rates that DPS charges to perform dispatch functions by contract, so its own rates. And then second, a requirement for the commissioner of DPS to adopt rules regulating the technical and operational standards that shall apply to any entity performing dispatch functions in the state on and after July 1, 2021. So um, I'm going to throw out a couple things here. We, um, Senator Colmore, you said that you had some um, information from some of your uh, towns that said put off the uh, setting of the rates, and um, I my I am not sure I'm right here, but and we can hear from the commissioner tomorrow. But this. Um, they can set rates and start charging. Without this, I think that what we're asking them to do is to adopt rules around that. They've already, my understanding is that they've already come up with the rates. Um, and this is saying they should, they need to adopt rules about how they're going to apply those rates. And this is for dispatching of uh, not just police, this is whoever they dispatch for. Their um, DPS dispatches for different <coughs> services in different towns. And, um, and the towns that don't want this to happen are the towns that haven't been paying for it at all. But my understanding is that the commissioner told us, he came in with a chart and told us how much they, they've come up with. And, what we're asking here, I believe, is for them to adopt some rules around around the uh, setting and um, uh, adopting those. Uh, it's set to set rules around them so that they have some um, consistency in how they're applying them and whether they're going to let towns um, who want to. I mean, you know my feeling about this to begin yes, with. Yes, I do. So I won't repeat it, but. Um, the, they need to have some rules around how they're going to do it. Are they going to have a phase in? Are they going to, um, for towns that aren't paying anything now, are they going to 
have a less of a phase in than for towns that they might be dispatching for that are paying something. So I think okay. that's what we're asking here. Is that right, Betsy? Yes. Uh, so if you want to look at the uh, actual current law language on page 20 at the top, so it's already current law authority for the Commissioner of Public Safety to enter into contractual arrangements to perform dispatching functions for state, municipal, or other emergency services, establishing the charges sufficient to cover the cost of dispatching. So that's their current law authority. And so what you would be adding here is uh, a requirement to adopt rules that set forth the rates that they charge. So it'd be set out how they would establish the charges for the contracting for dispatch that they already do. And if, they're, if they have to do it by rule, that means they have to have public input. Okay, thank you. The other, okay, so that section, is, the other thing that came up is about uh, number two there, section, lines eight through 10. And that DPS, you know, originally we had thought maybe the E911 board should do it. They felt that it was not the way they were structured. They didn't have the resources to be able to do it. And so we just uh, threw it at DPS. The, um, one of the problems out here in the field, well, uh, Mark, maybe I'll let you just um, weigh in here instead of me trying to um, interpret what you said. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I've spoken with a, a variety of people, including uh, Chief Hazelton from Rescue Inc., uh, our local EMS squad, uh, Chief Fitzgerald from Brattleboro Police Department, uh, Chief Bukasi from the Brattleboro Fire Department, uh, Assistant Chief Cogliano from the West Armerston Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, we're, none of us are here saying we disagree with this. We're saying we disagree with this right now. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, but reason number one, uh, uh, conversation with the Department of Public Safety, these rules have not been created yet, uh, which I don't think they would be simply because uh, this isn't a law yet. Uh, however, uh, we don't know what those rules would regulate. Um, Department of Public Safety currently oversees uh, law enforcement and uh, fire agencies, but they don't oversee EMS agencies. Uh, the nature of dispatching across fire, law enforcement, and EMS are starkly different uh, for a variety of reasons that are far more technical uh, than I care to take the time uh, today. Uh, however, that being said, uh, another question then becomes, uh, when we talk about technical and operational standards, uh, to what boundaries are those? For example, just very quickly, Motorola radio systems are one of the most expensive radio systems on the market. And if the Department of Public Safety said, we're gonna go with Motorola radio systems and everybody has to use that system, it could put a lot of towns, uh, sheriffs, as well as other uh, entities such as uh, Fire and EMS in a position where they're looking at multi-million dollar upgrades without any uh, way to fund that cost. Uh, my personal opinion is to uh, remove this from this year's uh, bill and ultimately look at this in the future year uh, so that we can have a, a full discussion over what we're really looking to regulate. Um, another question uh, might be rather than to establish regulating standards that apply to any entity performing dispatch, rather apply to any entity performing the 911 dispatching and the state dispatching uh, and leave local municipalities, uh, local ambulance services, the sheriffs, um, the organizations that don't really come under state funding uh, to their own devices to try and do this. So that's the first part. The second part is, if you disagree with me on pulling that out, then let's talk about a committee of committees made up by the Fire Service uh, Training Council, the Criminal Justice Training Council, and I believe, forgive me for getting the name wrong, but the Vermont uh, Ambulance Advisory Board, um, which is the closest analog to the training councils. Let those each council pick one person to represent each council and that be the entity to develop these rules. And again, stick it out a couple of years so people have time to plan. Uh, dispatching is a complicated thing involved heavily in technicalities with radio systems that we bring engineers in for, we plan over a long time. Uh, so I'd ask that we at least have time and that we bring a committee of these entities in. Thank you. Thank you. So are there, um, I think Drew is with us. Do you wanna weigh in on this, Drew? 
Yeah, so I can weigh in uh, mostly from a, a personal uh, perspective down here in Southern Vermont, where um, we're dispatched out of uh, two different um, areas. Uh, we use uh, Key Mutual Aid Dispatch, which is out of uh, Southern New Hampshire, as well as Broad Road Dispatch Center. Um, there's uh, dispatching is very complicated, and I certainly can agree with the sheriff that if a uh, a standard was adopted that would require a certain type of radio, for example, um, um, switching over to all digital or switching over to what we would, you know, uh, P25 compliant, the cost and associated um, infrastructure would be cost prohibitive for us um, just because of, of the area that we, we work in and the fact that we don't receive, you know, the state funding for those um, assets. So uh, I would definitely support uh, looking into and understanding more of what these standards are going to look like before being forced to, you know, try to budget for you know, massive uh, upgrades and in infrastructure. Committee. Sounds like I'm in agreement with both Mark and uh, Drew. Okay. Anthony. Chris Ray. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, uh, right. Okay. Allison? This is not my field of expertise. I would defer to those who, who, who are recommending this. It's fine, I guess. I, I, I think that we should, we should uh, have standards. Um, so, but I, I do agree that the DPS is probably not the, the most appropriate so um, maybe since nothing's going to happen before January anyway, really, right? We know we know that. Rather than setting up this uh, committee, maybe we should put it in next year's bill. Whoever of us happen to be around next year, and uh, make sure that there are standards that are set so that and not not standards that say everybody has to use the the same equipment or anything, but some some minimum standards so that people around the state are getting um, equal equal access to dispatch and um, does that make sense? So maybe it's it's standards and ec ec equitable service. Yeah, it, well, it's standards for it's the way it says is technical and operational. So, and I think that one of the fears is that the technical what Mark was pointing out about the like the Motorola system as opposed to the other systems and then the technical with um, dispatching for EMS is very different and dispatching for fire is very different. So you need to have people if it, I would I would say that next year when we look at this, we should look at having representatives from those those um, three three major dispatch um, services. And maybe it would be a field trip. <laughs> Talks about field trips. I just had if, to smile. If we were, if we were in the room, I would kick your shin. <laughs> I know you, your legs aren't long enough now, though. I know. There is yes, a, Brian. So, are we uh, proposing to strike lines eight, nine, and ten from that section? I think that's Mark's first proposal and Drew's first proposal. I agree. And with if that. we disagree with striking, then at least set up this other group to set the standards. I would like to strike it. So, Chris, strike, 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 strike a little too. That's no, what I'm the on the actual is. bill. I'm on the actual bill too. So it's it's lines eight, nine, and ten on page twenty. Yeah, yeah it's little too. Okay, great. Chris Bray. Well, there's a joke about computing related stuff or electronics, you know, that we love standards. That's why there are so many of them. Um, <laughs> and the, the problem is when we don't standardize enough, we end up with inner, uh, inoperable, <laughs> incompatible stuff that in, in the end drives costs higher. So there's right. some sort of balance between not driving everyone into something that's too pricey, but finding a way to help interoperability facilitate yeah. that. And I think that was that was the point of this, of having some kind of, but we may have picked the wrong 
place to <laughs> the wrong be. place um, to try to. Yeah, this may not be very helpful help. So right. Uh, so and it, it wouldn't be effect if we put the date out. It wouldn't. That wouldn't. It'd no, be because the 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 DPS is the wrong right place to have it done. So right. if we wanted to put it in there and put the date out, it would have to be a, a composed of a different group. And if we were going to. We would have to take a lot more testimony from those three groups. Got it. I believe. So we'll table it till next year. Anthony? Uh, yeah, yes, although it's important that we get it done. I mean, I don't mind what we're talking about here in terms of deleting this part from the bill and giving it more time, but and then we say we're going to do it next year, which is, you know, I just hope we do it. I think it's got to get done at some point. It seems like we've been putting it off. Yeah. Maybe, maybe what we could do is so that we, it doesn't get lost is um, ask the training council, a representative from the training council, from the fire council, and from the EMS advisory committee council and the ambulance, whatever that organization is to um, consider how best to um, address the issue of standards for dispatch. Not, not to come up with the rules, but then come back in January and say, this is how you, you should address it by having these people actually adopt the rules or you should address it by having um, the president of the United States adopt the rules or but having the having that group come back to us so that it doesn't actually get lost well yeah, and I, I hesitate to say this but uh, it makes me think that you should write a letter well but also Jeanette the plus of doing that is it not only doesn't get lost but it advances it I mean it, it and and begins a lot of the conversation out of the room so that the parties that are the stakeholders that are key to the successful setting up of those standards are, are engaged and proposing a solution. Well, I don't think we want them to start adopting rules. What we want them to do is to come to us with a, a proposal about yeah. how to best approach the setting of standards. Yes, I think that would be great. Um, does that work for you, Brian? Yeah, I would support that as long as you get equal representation from law enforcement, fire, EMS, and municipal folks, because they're the ones that are gonna have to come up with the, the money to uh, purchase whatever the equipment is that meet the standards. I, I just want a broad, I don't need United Nations numbers in terms of a, a group either. I just, it should be a small four or five member group that can begin to look at, you know, what should the standards be and, and to prevent a municipality from already have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on something and then be told, yeah. guess what, that doesn't meet the standard. So what if you had somebody from the VLCT, the training council, the fire academy council, EMS and the ambulance service uh, organization? That would, that would work. Madam Chair, could I interrupt for one minute? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I couldn't raise my hand on my computer for some reason. Um, well, I, I can't see. I can't see it anyway because you. <laughs> yeah, well, your can. hand is raised on your on here, but I don't look at the participant list, so you just have to shout. Um, at the at the risk of not sounding interested, because I do have vested interest in this topic, I don't think that a member of the training council is an appropriate agency to discuss this issue. Um, I do think. That perhaps somebody from the Chiefs Association and or the Sheriff's Department, um, the agency that would be affected by these changes, where the training council would really only pertain to training, not dispatching per se. Yeah, I think that it was said to the, the training council because they do law enforcement training and the thought was they would appoint somebody like, I'm echoing. I, um, but yeah, Sheriff Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, my proposal was to turn to the training council to appoint a person right. to represent uh, law enforcement interests. It's not to put it as a training council uh, issue, but rather turn to the training council rep 
which represents, or maybe the LE, LEAB is a, a more appropriate choice, but um, to something that represents the eight to 16 different organizations that are gonna want representation, uh, which could serve as a sole voice on behalf of law enforcement, opposed to inviting uh, as Senator Collimore uh, referenced, the United Nations Council, where the law enforcement executives are going to want 15 people, the fire chiefs are going to want at least nine, and I don't know what a EMS will ask for, but at the end of the day, everybody's going to want to have a voice at the table. Um, I think at least uh, nudging the football forward uh, in this context allows us to say who does need to be involved in the conversation. Does leagues of cities and towns represent the municipalities well enough, or does leagues of cities and towns uh, that uh, somebody else is more apt to have that conversation on behalf of the municipalities. I don't know that answer, uh, but I thought that that could be a starting point to figure out who the right people would be. And since we're not actually setting the standards or the rules here, we're, this group is going to come to us and say, how is the best way to go about setting the standards? So is the LEAB? Um, and asking them to come. Is that, that is me um, echoing, isn't it? No, it's the person whose number ends in 010. Okay. Have the YouTube going, there you go. Thank you. Oh, they were watching it on YouTube while they were with us. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so if we said some, the LEAB should um, appoint somebody to represent the law enforcement community. The fire council would appoint somebody to represent the fire community. And that is fire community. That isn't, we're gonna have one who represents chiefs and one who represents paid people and one who represents volunteers. And then the VLCT and then the EMS advisory council. And they will come to us with a suggestion of how best to go about setting standards for uh, technical and operational um, uh, e dispatch services and who needs to be involved and how, how to go forward. That way, as Anthony said, it doesn't get lost. Betsy Ann? Got it. <laughs> okay. Brian? I'm fine with that. Chris Bray? Sorry, got to hit the, um, yes, I'd like the, a good solution. Anthony, I assume you agree with it since you suggested it. a great it. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had thought of it. <laughs> Allison? Absolutely. That and we can leave the date there of, of um, yes, and July 2021, because that'll give some time for people to try and figure out how, but not to set the rules, not to start adopting rules, but just telling us how it should be done. That way, if none of us are here next year, we hope that doesn't happen, but if none of us are here next year, were you going to the Bahamas? What, what it didn't get that? lost. Huh? Are you going to the Bahamas? What are you doing? You're not coming back? <sighs> well, we're all hoping we come back, I believe. I think. And Betsy so, will be here to remind people anyway. And how, what did you mean about the uh, July 1st date that you want? <laughs> well, I think there was a, it we said that he should adopt rules by July 1st, 2021. And if we just say that they should come back to us with a report by, or report back to us, not with a report. We don't well, ever want to say with a report. Right, but what, what, what date do you want them to report to you? I, I would say uh, that they should report to us by um, end of the session in 21. Yeah, because otherwise July 21 makes no sense coming back to us because we aren't right. around. So, uh, Madam Chair, or I'm maybe, to, maybe, huh? I'm going to just excuse myself because I, I have to stand up or I'm going to go. Oh, I, we're, we uh, have to also. I have, I, I, yes, I've sat for three hours. I'm, Can we I'm just agree on a date for Betsy? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I'm going to do is ask um, Drew and Mark and Chris to come up with a date for when they should report back to us. And then we'll deal with that next time we address this. And we didn't get to any of the other issues here, but we will. And I apologize to Drew and to um, Gwen and Matt and 075, whoever that is, and Portal, whoever, Patrol, whoever that is. That could be it. <laughs> but so we'll put this on the schedule again for next week. And I'll try to get a schedule done by tomorrow so that we can, okay? Yeah, okay. I won't be joining you on that other meeting. I have a meeting with the governor. Oh, yes, well, okay, give him well, our best. Yes, and, and tell, tell him to let the training council hire somebody, go forward. Actually, oh, you know what? I will write, I, I'll write that down. And we'll write a letter to Mark. Actually, Jeanette, this committee has many things we'd like to say to the governor. No, but. <laughs> Right now, that's what we want to say. Interim director of the training council. Yes. yes, and go ahead with the search. And they won't hire anybody, but they should be going ahead with it. Okay. okay. And do you want any of us to come along with you for moral support or anything? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mark, were you raising your hand or were you waving goodbye? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm taking off. Thank you for your time. I also want to thank the committee for uh, designating me as a doctor on the agenda. Oh, uh, yes, I forgot honored, about that. The doctor a and a representative of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, That's I don't why he's outside. Is, I'm happy to support. Mm -hmm. I, I, lo I love that you're a PhD. I, I thought I was going to look at you with totally new eyes. I'm sorry to hear you aren't. <laughs> maybe one no, day. Maybe. I'm glad to hear you aren't. Thank you. Uh, I have to go. I was going to demote you. Okay, bye. 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 bye.